Well, we've been in a series where we've been focusing on 40 days of radical kindness. And it's meant to go along with the season of Lent, uh, 40 days leading up to uh, Holy Week and up to Easter. And really this season of Lent is, is aimed at taking kind of inventory of our lives, reflecting, introspection, you know, making sure are we, and asking questions, are we, are we following Jesus? Do we have our eyes on Jesus? Or have we gotten them off? Have we gotten them off of what Jesus has done for us? Have we gotten them off what Jesus has called us to? Have we gotten them off of paying attention to the life that God has shown us how to live through Jesus? 40 days of, of radical kindness is really meant to, to bring attention to how we are living the life that Jesus has called us to live. It's meant to, to bring attention to the, to the struggle, right? The actual struggle of, of selfish sin that can creep in. It's a practice that is, is meant to create rhythm. Because here's the deal. We can, you know, a lot of people give up stuff. You can give up stuff during Lent. You can, you can read the Bible. You can, you can do all kinds of things. You can talk and talk and talk about it. But if we are not living it, then we have missed the point. That's why we have framed this spiritual fruit of kindness in, in this way that, that it's supposed to be. Radical kindness should be the result of a radical life change that flows out of a new life in Jesus. And today we're gonna dive even deeper into why this radical kindness is not just your average everyday kindness. It's not, it's not a kindness that comes and goes based on how we feel. It is a kindness that becomes such a normal, natural act because it is Jesus living in us. Jesus helping us to not just live a good life, but to live his good life through us bringing healing, right? Standing up to injustice, standing between those who are vulnerable and marginalized and forgotten between them and the enemy of their souls, forgiving those who do not even know when they hurt us or what they are doing to us. Here's the, the point. And if you, if you are following along those notes and quotes, that QR code on that piece of paper or through the, the church center app, you can follow along on the sermon. But the point is, that through this radical kindness, the life of Jesus is seen in us. That's the whole point of this whole thing. And I don't know about you, I have found my, my own heart, my own mind at times, especially those times when, when those, those situations when my initial reaction is, is anger or revenge, I have found over these last even these last few weeks where we've just started this series, I have found myself asking the question, asking the question, how, how can I be kind in this situation? How can I show kindness? And I'll be truthful, it has wrecked me sometimes, all right? It has messed with me. Last week, we even talked about how there is kindness and we can have kindness even in conflict, Right? We looked at the words of Jesus in, in Matthew chapter 18 where he laid out an instruction for us to, to live by, particularly when we have conflict with other people who are followers of Jesus and, and when they do something against us, when they, he used the word, when they sin against us, he says to go to them first of all in private and the whole point is to try to win them back, to, to restore, to resolve, to, to bring resolution and reconciliation. And if that doesn't work, you don't just give up. Then you, you get a couple of other people who, are, who can speak even into your life and help you see things in your own life. And then you all go to them and you try to reconcile, restore. And if that doesn't work, you still don't give up. <laughs> you get a few more other people, a part of the group together. And together you go to them and you try to have reconciliation and gently and humbly restore the relationship. And if that doesn't work, if that doesn't work, then Jesus said, and we talked about this last week in Matthew 18, Jesus said, then treat them like pagans and tax collectors. And everybody's like, yeah, get them, Jesus. But then we think, wait a minute, who did Jesus hang out with? Who was Jesus kind to? 
He still doesn't let us off the hook. Come on, Jesus. Well, it's interesting. Out of that section we were in last week in chapter 18 of the book of Matthew, the next section has one of the disciples, Peter, who approaches Jesus and wants to know, you know, what's this really all about? How many times should we forgive somebody? If, in other words, Peter's hearing Jesus talk about how to handle conflict. He's, he's contemplating what Jesus is saying, right? Like, like it's sinking in and, and he's soaking on it a little bit. But what does this really look like in real life? You know, I mean, you go and talk to them privately, okay. You get some other people involved, yeah. You decide to stop expecting them to be people they aren't. But yet you still love them. You're still their friends. You're still kind to them. Because we all know, Peter would know, Jesus was called the friend of sinners. <laughs> but Peter wants to know, what's the cutoff point? When is enough enough? When can you stop forgiving them? Listen to what he says. This is Matthew 18, verse 21 through 22. He says, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? That's a lot of times. Is that enough? And Jesus is like, no, not seven times. Peter's probably like, I wish he would have just stopped right there. But he didn't. Jesus replied, read these last words with me, ready? But 70 times seven. It's interesting. Now, once again, I always want to be very, very cautious when we talk about these particular relationship pieces. When we talk about kindness and adversity today, I want, I want you to know we're not going to spend a lot of time on the subject of forgiveness per se, but it does play a critical role and how we step into kindness in the face of pain and suffering that is imposed on our lives from others. Pastor John and I, actually we were talking, Pastor John Webb, our youth pastor, we were all at a, a conference this week and he and I were talking about this subject of forgiveness and what does it mean to forgive someone and, and particularly when there is physical or verbal or emo emotional abuse. And first of all, I wanna say this to you, if you're experiencing, please, 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 please get professional help. Someone who can help you tell someone so you're not in this alone. But I really appreciated what Pastor John said to me, and I'm gonna keep this with me for a long time. This is in your notes and quotes if you're following along there. It says, he said to me, he said, to forgive someone does not always mean we have to stay within reaching distance of them. To forgive someone does not mean does not always mean we have to stay within reaching distance of them. That's why getting help is so important. Getting help is so important. But the reality is, to live in, in the broken world that we do live in means we all will be impacted by its brokenness. There will be some bosses who are unkind and mean to their employees. None of my staff better say anything, all right? There will be some employees who act in ways that are not right and that are unkind, exploiting the company. There will be some students who act in unkind ways. There will be some teachers who act in unkind ways. There will be relatives who will be... We've all been to Thanksgiving dinner, right? Like, there will be government officials and governments who exploit their citizens. There will be that other driver who cuts us off in traffic. There will be the person who steps in front of you in the line and cuts you off in the line. There will be people who, because of their inner chaos, will hit you with their ripples of their lives. And I think that covers a lot of area. And if I think we get the point. So how do we show kindness in the face of such brokenness? In the face of unfair circumstances, because life has a lot of unfair circumstances. When we are innocent, but have been treated like we are guilty. Well, Jesus has, has some guidance for us, has some instructions for us. For those of us who carry the name of Jesus on our lives, for thus, those of us who bear his name, 
This is what he says to us. In Luke chapter six, verse 27, hear the words that Jesus says. But to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks. And when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Read this next sentence, just this sentence. We all recognize it. Let's say it together, ready? Do to others as you would like them to do to you. Now he goes on here and he unpacks this. He goes, if you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners will lend to other sinners for a full return. But he comes back to it. Let's say it together, right? Let's just read the, the, rest, the whole part, rest of this. Ready? Here we go. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. Read this next part. Here we go. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. Here's the most important. Hear it out. Here we go. Ready? All together. For he is kind to those who are unthankful, and wicked. Ugh. My my very first lead pastor position I was serving in. Um, I hadn't been there. I think I was maybe there for about like three months. And one one Thursday night, I got a phone call. Now let me just tell you a little bit. Let me back up here and tell you this church that I served at. They had worked so hard to, they had, a, they had this trailer in the back and it, and it was full of inflatables, like really big inflatables, like the kind that, that, that companies use. And, and when, when I looked up what it was worth, what these inflatables worth, we had 10, 20, maybe like $30,000 worth of inflatables. Yes, they are that expensive, like the really big ones in the back of this and in this trailer on our property. And one night I got a phone call from one of our facilities people that said, Pastor Horton, our trailer has been stolen. It's gone. You know, new pastor, I'm thinking, all right, this is good. How are we gonna, how are we gonna handle this? So I come in and, and the police come and, and they check things out. They, they get an idea, a description of what the trailer looks like. And, and so then, you know, you think they're never going to find this trailer. A lot of these, a lot of these investigations go un, um, undone, right? Like I just, there's no way. They're long gone. It's whatever. Well, about two weeks later, I get another phone call and it's from the police. They're like, Pastor Horton, we have found, we found the, the trailer. I was like, okay. They said, we have a pretty good idea who the suspect is. And we'd like to come and talk to you about it. Sure, come on in, let's, let's talk. So they came in and they shared with me that at the scene where they found that trailer, they found a receipt for the Walmart where someone had purchased lock cutters, right? And they were able to take that receipt. They were able to go to Walmart. The timestamp was on there and they, they looked at which cashier, you know, the cameras that were angled on each cashier and, and they saw which cashier that that receipt came from and they narrowed it down to the person who bought those cutters. They're like, so... Pastor Horton, he's a young man in our community, grew up in a really tough situation. He lives with his mom, graduated high school, I think maybe like two years before this, one or two years before this. And like, what, what would you like us to do? Would want us to pick him up and what do you think we should do about this? And I thought about it for a moment. Uh, you know, because 
here were these inflatables that were, I know they're just inflatables, but the church had sacrificially gotten these. The, the people had poured so much energy into having these and, and we were gonna have them and use them for, for all kinds of events and, and for the community. You know, we wanted to get back to the community. We had so many great plans for these and, and now they were taken from us. And so all kinds of thought, you know, thoughts are flowing through my mind of, of what we should do and, and how, you know, if, if somebody doesn't stop these people, they'll, they'll just keep on doing it. But then something else entered my mind. What if this is an opportunity to show kindness and mercy to actually be what the church always says that it is? So I said to him, I said, well, would you just, let's do this if he would be willing to come and sit down with me, and I'd just like to have a conversation with him. And sure enough, it worked out. The young man came and he met with me and we, we talked and he was really sorry for what he had done. And I was able to show kindness to someone who really had meant harm to us meant to hurt us. But I believe, to some degree, this is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is saying in these words to, to love our enemies, to do good, to bless, to pray for. He goes farther than just, just keeping to yourself, and he goes further than just being kind to those who are kind back to you. But in order to do that, we have to make a determination that, that this kindness, this way of living, this way of operating our lives, it like, it's like it becomes simply, it has to be how we go about doing this Jesus life that we've been called to live, that we have the chance to live, that Jesus offers us. And so here's my first point. This radical kindness shapes our lives. It shapes our lives. When we choose to, to live with these instructions from Jesus, it's so radical. And at first, we may have to wrestle with our fear. We, we might have to wrestle with the expectations of the society around us. We might have to wrestle with the mindset of the, of the kings and kingdoms of this world because this mindset that Jesus is talking about, it's meant to bring healing. It's meant to repel the disease of sin. It's meant to help us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That's what it's meant to do. So the same Peter, who if you go back to this part in Matthew, was who had asked Jesus how many times do you have to forgive, he actually got it. Listen, listen to what Peter writes in his, in his own book, right? Peter chapter, 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9 says, Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender hearted and keep a humble attitude. Listen to here. This is Peter's words, right? Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That sounds like radical kindness to me. <laughs> He says, that is what God has called you to do and he will grant you his blessing. Jump down to verse 13. Peter goes on, he says, now, listen to him. He says, who will want to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Read the next sentence, just the next sentence with me, ready? Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle, oh, get these words. This is coming from Peter, right? Of all people. Do this in a gentle gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear 
Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. Isn't that awesome? Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. This is the Peter, right? The same Peter who wanted to know how many times he should forgive, right? Like, where's the cutoff point, Jesus? This is the, the Peter who tried to even, if you read about the story of Jesus and the life of Jesus, when Jesus is arrested in the garden and, and, and on the night where he would be tried and eventually he would be put on the cross, on the, at the very beginning of that, when a soldier comes to arrest Jesus, this is the Peter who chops off the soldier's ear and Jesus has to clean up his mess. Peter it sounds like from what he's writing here, had gotten it. As he followed Jesus, even when Jesus was no longer physically present, Peter knew that Jesus' presence was with him. The Holy Spirit guided Peter and kept him. Peter kept remembering the bigger picture. I love what he says there in, in 14 and 15. He says, but even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. Don't you love that? Back to the words of Jesus in Luke 6, 35. Jesus says, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be paid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. I can't get over this last part of this line, for He is God. God is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Do you see? Do you see how Jesus' words? This, this, this kindness also comes from a place that knows that there is so much more than just what we see. This, this radical kindness is an eternal act, right? We are acting with, with some kind of, an, this, is, this, is, this action, this radical kindness is acting in such a way, it's, it's like from another world. Jesus says, when we act this way, our reward from heaven will be very great. We will be acting as children of the Most High. Listen, do not sell this radical kindness short. Don't act like it's some kind of weak way of living that it's just all about goody goody, you know, warm fuzzies all the time. It costs Jesus something. So don't pretend it doesn't matter. Don't underestimate how important that it is. Here's my second point. Radical kindness plays the long game. It is the long game of eternity. It matters that much. Jesus says, even God, God is kind. He is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. Now, how many of us wish God wasn't kind about like that, right? But then how many times have we been unthankful and wicked? Talk about radical, a radical way of thinking, a radical way of acting, a radical way of living. But the truth is this radical kindness comes from a radical kind of God. Here's my last point for us. The truth is, radical kindness requires radical surrender. 
It requires obedience. Obedience to the words and the life of Jesus. That song we just sang, this is the kingdom, seek first the kingdom. Those are the very words of Jesus. And if that sounds heavy, if that sounds like, oh, I can't do that, that is too much, I have some really good news for us today, right? We don't have to do it by ourselves. If we choose to radically surrender, to love Jesus with our whole being, to love our neighbor as ourselves, as we love ourselves, if we really do that, listen, listen to what Jesus says. This is in John chapter 14. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. He said, the world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. Listen, this radical kindness, which requires radical surrender, the only way that we can live with this kind of kindness that loves our enemies, that does good to those who hate us, that, that, that prays for those who curse us, the only way we can live like that and with that kind of power is through the help of the Holy Spirit. And there will be times where we get it wrong. There will be times where we will mess up. I have messed up on more than one occasion. But it's when the Holy Spirit prompts our hearts and reminds us reminds us to, to apologize, reminds us to, to make things right. That is the work of the Holy Spirit who is moving in our lives and shaping our lives. But in order to do that, it takes radical surrender. It doesn't just happen by accident. So that we can have this radical kindness a radical kindness that shapes us, a radical kindness that, that plays the long game, that, that knows that, that this radical kindness is, is eternal, an eternal hope view of life, that it helps us to act as children of the Most High, but it requires surrender. Surrendering of our lives, surrendering of our hearts, asking forgiveness from God, and maybe even asking forgiveness from others. Will we be obedient? Will we, will we live and walk in the Holy Spirit in such a way that a radical kindness? <laughs> Can you imagine? A few hundred people in a, in a church right here who choose to intentionally embrace this radical kindness, the, the ripple effect. You know, we talk about the ripple effect of bad things in people's lives that affect us and, and their choices. What if somehow this radical kindness is a ripple effect that turns the tide? Wouldn't that be beautiful? Would you stand? Would you bow your heads, close your eyes as we move into a time of reflection and just listening? For all of us in this room, I want to ask you, will you surrender? Will you surrender your life to Jesus? A prayer we, we pray every single week. A simple prayer for those who would like to give their lives to Jesus or recommit their lives. I invite you to pray it now. If you want to give your life to Jesus, if you want to surrender to Jesus, this is how it goes. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, I confess my sins and I ask for forgiveness. And the last line of this prayer, I believe, is so important. Says, Jesus, I trust that you do forgive me and I receive your love. Receive his love today. It is for you. It is for us. 
have a little extra today for us to think about as we pray and focus on the voice of God. Today, do you want the power to live like this? The power to live with this kind of radical kindness that, that can actually help you to love. Love those who seem so unlovable to you. The power to do good to those who even hate you. The power to, to even be able to pray for those who curse you, to bless those who are unkind to you. If that's what you want, I invite you to pray to receive the Holy Spirit into your life today. And here's the prayer. May we all need to pray this together. Holy Spirit, come and fill my life. Holy Spirit, come and help me to love my enemies, to do good to those who hate me, to bless those who curse me. Holy Spirit, help me to pray for those who hurt me. Holy Spirit, I pray you would help us today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.